Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, yes, that is the title, flopped tremendously over Memorial Day weekend, and their opening was only $31 million domestically on a production budget of $168 million, that's not even including the marketing budget, and it would be one of the worst Memorial Day weekend openings in nearly three decades. Three decades. I, I love the example that they gave that in 1995, Casper opened to worse. Why the really? hell was Casper opening in, in, in on Memorial Day weekend and not over Halloween? That is bizarre. Uh, but it, it was the 90s. Yeah, we, we were crazy. It was the 90s. But not just that. Uh, that's you could get away with a lot. Look. Money went to, like, that meant a lot more tickets sold in 1995 true, to make true. this much True, true. If you money. adjust for inflation, then yeah. it might be a bigger record of flopping than yeah. you even think it is. And I, by the way, I think the number, I think they rounded it up to $32 million. Oh. Yeah. Okay. To, so that it could beat Garfield. Great. Yeah. So Garfield may have uh, mogged Furiosa. Furiosa was the worst performing film for Memorial Day in 30 years. It needs over 500 million just to break even after marketing. Despite great reviews, it made just 31 million and barely beat a Garfield movie nobody knew about. I knew about the Garfield movie. And that was it. That's me. Literally just I'm just the only it. person. And, and people that don't like Chris Pratt. So knew the about theories, the movie. yeah, the theories about why Furiosa failed. Uh, or could fail, I guess. And we're every, flying. So and, every, uh, single, every single Twitter discussion was some variety yes. of the same topics. It's ticket prices. It's female action stars. It's the streaming window. It's coming It's coming straight from the theaters to pay VOD too quickly. Uh, is Mad Max relevant in 2024, given that the first one came out in 1979? All fair points. Well, it's also a Mad Max movie without Mad Max, Max in it. Correct. Um, <laughs> so the quartering... Tweeted, people are sick of female protagonists, and this rustled a lot of feathers. A lot of people disagreed with him, including Lauren Southern, and they got into Again, I was a like, bit of a back and forth. I was like, why is Lauren, like, it's just, maybe I just don't follow Lauren Southern, but I just didn't imagine Lauren Southern talking about something like this. She seems to pay some attention to pop culture. So she said, no one is sick of female protagonists. They're sick of poorly written movies. So would you agree with that take? Or are people legitimately sick of female no, protagonists? Here's my take on it. It's that when it's done right, people don't care. But it's been done wrong so many times, and people no longer give them the benefit of the doubt to go and see. Mm -hmm. We thought Fall Guy was fantastic. Nobody gave it the benefit of the doubt to go and see. We th I thought I didn't think Furiosa was the greatest movie ever, but it certainly wasn't awful. But... Yeah. Nobody went and saw it because nobody's giving it the benefit of the doubt anymore. And on like, top of that, you have to work new, um... you have to work to prove now that it's not identity first. Like so basically the, I have the same thought when I watch TV, right? I give it like three strikes you're out. Like if I hear a certain amount of buzzwords in the first episode, I'm out. And it has to happen there. I'm not even worried about wokeness. I think it's really just quality mm -hmm. and the writing is shit. And, and I don't think it's... I, I'm not worried about movies being woke these days. I'm worried about them being bad. Yeah. That's a way bigger problem is that they're not putting enough effort in. And people keep yes, drawing. Fall Guy was great. Furiosa was serviceable at best. I, I mean, it was fine. It was cringe. It, like some of the dialogue was cringe, but it was fine. There's and also now like people aren't even giving a chance to the new John Krasinski movie that's for kids if, called yeah. If. That's like starring Ryan Reynolds, who's supposedly a movie star. Nobody's watching that. Nobody cares because it's not a recognizable name. But now, even with a recognizable name in the title, a Mad Max saga, still no one is coming out to see it. And it just leaves everyone kind of asking questions or, or having half-baked theories as to why people don't want to go to the movies anymore. There's also a fundamental difference between a movie for women with a female lead and an action movie with a female lead. So mm -hmm. the example that other people were bringing up was Barbie and how much money Barbie made. Yes, a movie for girls starring a girl yeah. made a bunch of money because when we went to the theater, it was chock full of groups of women together who went all dressed up in pink and talked about how excited they were to see this movie. 
when you go to see a movie about a female protagonist in a predominantly male genre, that used to be a cause for excitement because it was against the norm. You've subverted expectations so many times that that's not the norm anymore, or not that that's the norm now. It's no longer unique. So when you go and do that, you have to work to prove that it's a good script. You can't just send people in there and expect people to come out happy. You have to actually work. Well, if they wanted to go with a male protagonist other than Max, would they have made a movie about Dementis? Uh, would they have made a movie about also, Joe? Look, I don't know. Mad Max just it doesn't have the cachet. That, like, the it's 2015 not. one didn't make that much money <laughs> relative to its budget. It was a good movie, It was a though. great movie, but that doesn't mean that it made a whole ton of money. It took yeah. eight years to get it out came out in 20 or nine years to get it out. It took, it came out in 2015. Mm -hmm. And when you make and look, I always make the example. I say, look, prequels to me are a hard sell anyways. They always are. You don't need to explain everything away. So one of the examples people gave to the contrary was Wonka made good money this year or last year. And was a, it was considered technically a prequel, but it's not even really a prequel. It's almost like they're starting from scratch. I mean, look, the Barbie movie was basically a prequel to Barbie. <laughs> It was just, this, I, I'm getting tired of retreading old territory. I did enjoy what, what Matt Kadish was saying, which is like, look, stop putting the movies on streaming three weeks after they come out. Like that, which is what they did with How long Fall Guy. should it be then? Okay, so this is what he said. He goes, if studios just rewound their business model to pre-COVID era, had a six-month window between theatrical and home video, embraced physical media, and licensed their content to Netflix and Amazon for streaming without running their own streaming services, they'd be profitable again. That's the problem. Everyone's aiming for self-sufficiency in a market that doesn't necessarily need that many people. Mm -hmm. Right? Like... It just doesn't. So beyond that, the the fact that movies come out right after. Look, I saw people still blaming COVID for this. I didn't, but that's uh, crazy. <laughs> there, there was people still blaming COVID for this. That is still a thing. I mean, it's a legitimate. It it's a legitimate reason that people don't go to theaters anymore. You know, if you know that it's going to be on streaming eventually, why the heck would you spend that amount of money? to see it on a bigger screen. There's also this little <laughs> chestnut that you have to remember. Uh, they chestnut? Hate, they hate you. The people in Hollywood hate you. They do. For the most part, they hate you. We go see these movies and review them, and I'm very good at separating art from artist. But the average person who does not know nor care isn't going to want to read stuff about how it's the audience's fault that this stuff keeps happening. This is Chase Mitchell, who is a writer for the Jimmy Fallon show. He says, oh. I think it's time to accept that a large part of the moving going public sucks, you know. S. Yes. Is he, uh, wait, so is he saying that because... He was talking about Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Um, because Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes performed better than something else that no, he that liked? No, because it just didn't, it fell to fourth place already and it's not doing that well. Oh, because he loved the Planet of the mm -hmm. Apes movie so much that he thought it deserved better. A lot of people were putting huh. the, okay, so this was another one. So I, I found this one too. I was fascinated by how many people took the let's go back and blame the audience routine. You are beholden to the audience. They are essentially your master and it is your job to please them if you actually want to make any money. This is what it says. Mm -hmm. Judging by the huge amount of best thing ever comes out makes zero money stories I've witnessed in the last 20 years. I think it's fair to say that the point uh, is that general audiences just suck A this time. Again, they're blaming literally everyone but themselves. It is your job to get the public's interest. It is your job to write stories that are compelling and then work with an advertising team that knows how to best convey that through trailers. Your job, not their job. Sure, uh, coming from the perspective of the people making these movies, that's obviously a terrible excuse. Mm -hmm. But I will grant that, you know, when I see The Fall Guy does so badly in the box office compared to Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which in my opinion is just objectively bad, mm. it's disheartening and it does feel like it is kind of the audience's fault for not taking a chance on original content when they constantly say, I want original content. Mm -hmm. That is their fault. If you're asking and complaining about recycled crap all the time and then you don't watch the things that aren't recycled crap mm -hmm. 
That it's, is your fault. It's still You're voting their job with your to, It's still their job to, to influence you somehow, right? Mm-hmm. So whether it's they didn't spend enough money on marketing, whether the trailers cut together weren't interesting enough to people. And look, none of this calls into, into question one of the other things, which is just the economy. The economy kind of sucks. I also saw some people saying that it's not the movie ticket's fault. It's the concession's fault because movie tickets are expensive, but they're not that expensive. Well, guess what? It's still your job to convince the audience that it is worth their time and money to go out and spend $20 on tickets, $20 per ticket. Or and $6, then, whatever and then it is. a gazillion dollars on food, or at least make them feel like your movie is worth sneaking some food in. Yeah, that's also a valid point. I mean... It depends on where you live, obviously, but you can't just deny that the prices of of movie tickets have gone up. Yeah. And you can't just deny that, like, people are are more willing to sit at home on the couch and watch something that they've already seen ten times yeah. than go see something new for the first time because it makes you have a midlife crisis to waste two hours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I find something that, a, that you hate. I find that most of the time, just the theater experience makes it worth it for me. Like just yeah. the act of getting, it keeps me off my phone for sure. two and a half hours, which is always beneficial. There's a $20 one there. Pop culture junkie. Another reason the better theater systems, home Dolby Atmos, laser projectors and 85 inch TVs. Yeah. yeah. That's stuff that people didn't really have access to in the 90s or in the, the ability 2000s. to pause and, and Look, yeah and in visiting the theater used to be a community experience that everybody could do on the weekends when there was less options to do but it is your job as an industry leader to find your find a way to make a product that makes those other options less interesting so in the age of youtube in the age of tiktok you have to find a way to drag uh you know the youths into the theaters and get them there it worked for five nights at freddy's well, I guess they think the answer is to um, put YouTubers in the movies. Yeah, oh, which also is kind of look. They did misguided. that. In, they did that in, uh, in <laughs> Free Guy. The, they put a bunch of YouTubers they put in Matt Pat in the Five Nights at Freddy's yeah. movie, but he was in there for like five seconds, and that's not the, mo- the reason the movie went, did well. Yeah. Um, another take said Fall Guy was marketed poorly and was never going to make money. How did you? Did you think that Fall Guy was marketed poorly? Is I there not an obvious way to market it? I don't know how you market that movie. Like, because uh, it's a balance between rom com and action. action. You're not sure how to sell it to anyone. Yeah, I mean, it's why subgenres are sometimes a hard sell. Right? I don't know. It, it splits the audience. And that uh, Furiosa was a prequel to a borderline flop, which was Fury Road. I, I read this also the other day. The 2024 box office is $700 million behind the 2023 box office. A large amount of that being Super Mario Brothers at this point. Mm-hmm. Right? So they need a billion dollar win and fast. I mean, back to the theory that the problem is a female protagonist. You're right that it's not the female protagonist part. It's the genre that you're putting a female protagonist mm-hmm. in. Absolutely. I say this all the time. A male dominated genre. Okay, it's the same thing for a Marvel movie, for instance, but it's an action movie and you are trying to make women like it, but women are never going to like action movies as much as men. That's just a fact. And women are not going to be going to the theaters dressed up as Furiosa with shaved heads and war paint on their foreheads. It's not going to happen. It's, I kind of think of it as like, I call it like a reality buy-in. So you're watching a war-torn land with a bunch of warlords and, and crazy people. It's a natural fit for a male protagonist. It just is. Just like when you watch a cop show, sure, there are plenty of female cops and female detectives in the world, but inherently... It's an industry dominated by men, so it's easier to get people to buy into a man doing that role. Sure. Right? So if you're going to take a female protagonist, back in the day it was enough to just make them hot and make the movie crazy and let the sex appeal and the action speak for itself. Well, we don't live in the age of sex appeal and action sequences anymore because you're not allowed to have sex appeal anymore. Now it has to be identity politics and action sequences. I was talking about this because I I was, again, I'm watching this show called uh, Almost Paradise. And there's like a female detective in the show whose kind of job it is to play like straight man to the the main character in it. And she's kind of standoffish 
in, in a lot of scenes, but they allow her, at least at the end of the pilot episode and in subsequent episodes, to have moments of actual honesty that feel real. When you're doing that in an action movie, like there are moments of that in Furiosa. Here's the problem. There's been too many examples of them not getting it right that nobody's going to risk spending $150 to see if you can give it the old college try and succeed. And they probably can't articulate it as well as you just did why they don't like exactly. new movies. Okay, They're and, just like, this isn't good. And I'll give you an example of how the show I was talking about failed recently. There is an episode, uh, like episode six, dealing with this female character's backstory. Her uh, The character's name is Eve or Eva. Um... And she's acting completely differently. She's being really rude to the main character, which most of the time they have like a, a back and forth banter, but it's not actual rudeness. And she ends up being wrong the whole episode. And at the end, she doesn't apologize. Any year prior to 2016, I feel like that character apologizes and there's an actual moment of humanity between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Instead, she stays stoic and the main character sure gets to be right, but she doesn't get humbled. And both men and women understand that it's important to show humility when you're wrong. But in a genre where you're not technically usually the, the main character, it speaks to her femininity to be willing to admit when, they're, when she's wrong. Sure. Probably more than men would. Or to appear angry all day and then burst into tears. <laughs> So when you see this in movies, <laughs> yes, thank you, Kai, Kai, not uh, whatever I said. Uh, but the point is, is that in movies now, it's why people complain about the writing, right? They say mm -hmm. that they're just men. Well, that's hard to articulate. But the point is, is that a female character that's actual, uh, that actually has a lot of feminine traits will ring true to the audience the way a, a male character with masculine traits, which is what they're trying to appear, uh, these female characters to appear as, feels natural. It doesn't feel natural when the roles swap. It's okay for Dementis to be kind of bitchy and whiny because he's a villain, right? That's his job to be a villain and to be annoying. But a male protagonist shouldn't be that way. And a female protagonist should, should carry some inherently female characteristics. And then this is not my critique of Furiosa. I don't honestly don't remember it well enough to remember. I think for the most part, she did really, really well in her interactions with uh, the other guy were good. Sure. But audiences are done. And they're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt. They're just not. Doing it right one time isn't going to fix doing it wrong a thousand it's times. It's going to take years before that happens. And that's mm -hmm. never, let's face it. It only moves one direction. Sure. We're and never also, going back to that. The character of Furiosa, uh, you know, worked in Fury Road because she doesn't have a backstory. And you don't need to know how she lost her arm. And you don't need to know why, she's, why she is such a bitch. Mm. And you don't really need to give that character a full backstory anyway. So this movie was never necessary. It wasn't. No, no prequel really is. I really want to write some type of essay on what I mean when I say that it. What, about you don't know why but you know you can't put it to words but you understand inherently when you see characters acting a certain way it could be something as simple as nobody likes bitchy characters but like whiny male characters uh, as annoying as they are do get more leeway if they're in the action genre because they know society won't give them leeway Mm -hmm. When women characters are bitchy, they know society will give them leeway, and that's a turnoff to audiences. People don't like it when people don't act strong, mm -hmm. right? And when female characters are overly strong but whiny, that doesn't make any time. sense. It's, You're it, right. It's a contradiction in terms. It's very hard to put to words, but every single person who is watching this show right now has at least watched one or two movies where they know what I'm talking about. They don't know why it's wrong, but it's wrong. Thanks for watching. Listen to full episodes of Pop Culture Crisis on Spotify. Keep up with us on social media and make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss the show. Bye guys.